Hey everybody, I am so excited because today I have Kathy Kelly here, esteemed conductor, coach, musician, uh, everything related to classical music here. Kathy, you don't know anything about video game music, right? I don't know anything about video game music. We have a true non-gamer who has never heard anything about video game music, but of course has worked in some of the greatest theaters and opera companies and symphonies of the world. So we're really excited to expose you, I guess, to video game music. I'm totally excited because the last video game that I think I remember playing was Asteroids in the 80s. My piano teacher, um, Stephen DeGroote, in, in college was a winner of the Van Cliburn competition and the best Asteroids player I ever met. He was super competitive about it. Oh and there was a machine in the grocery store across from the music school. And he would go there like on breaks and play on one quarter for like two and a half hours. Oh my God. He was a god of Asher. <laughs> well, video game music has really come a long way since the chip to <laughs> so I'm in, extremely intrigued for you to hear some of these. And I have picked some of your requests, of course, on the community post. If you in the future, if you'd like to um, have your requests come up here, definitely post those in the community post. We're going to be diving into a lot of the classics and a lot of classical elements and then maybe some uh, some left hooks here to to uh, surprise Kathy. We'll start with Elden Beast. That uh, sounds kind of Wagnerian, I have to say. Elden Beast is from a game called Elden Ring. There's a lot of Christian symbolism in it, and it's from this company called FromSoft, and they make games that are all based around medieval, high Victorian, Lovecraftian type of game. And it, they're dark, they're, they're brutal, they're very difficult, and Elden Beast is actually the final boss. This all sounds very classical music to me. It's gorgeous, for one thing. Um, yeah. I think because we were just making jokes about Wagner, the first thing that came to my mind was the beginning of Tristan after the overture. Mm -hmm. There's this folk-like song that a young sailor sings on the ship. That was a, a trope that was kind of used in opera at that time. There's the big orchestral interlude, and then it gets really simple and almost like folk like like a throwback to an earlier time it's kind of a way of signifying to everyone in the theater either we're going back in time or like tale as old as time in the plot actually this this elden beast which is like basically this celestial emissary of of the divine will i forget the exact the exact names but essentially out of like this more german <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Each right now is going like what Did call the elden beast actually emerges out of this um character named radagon of the golden order who was this prolific fighter and uh you find him sort of essentially crucified you know you fight this husk basically and uh and then the elden beast emerges out of this and you essentially fight it on this like celestial plane, it really does have this sort of like I think of uh, of Deserto sulla Terra from Trovatore, for instance, where there is you know it marks that sort of like it's a placid intro with a singer over top. It's a cool trope that you're right. It has to, I didn't even think about that. That's interesting. I mean, I love the the chorus and the solo. You know, even like not knowing the whole Elden Ring plot or anything that that's it's clearly like an opposing forces mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sort of situation. I feel like this composer must have like done their Wagner homework. The string sounds that come in, it's really viola heavy, and I'm like, mm -hmm. Richard like that. Her name is actually Yuka Kitamura. She's actually a Japanese oh. composer and uh it's absolutely fun fantastic. Every boss has a theme that reflects them as a character, and each of them have two phases which makes me actually think of modern uh, symphonic work where obviously we, we we hear that as three or four uh, different movements, but these all have two. It's really cool to uh, hear a music like this that I actually believe could belong in a symphony hall right now in 2023. Yeah. And this was composed last year. There are living composers that are breathing life into 
old classical tropes that we've heard for hundreds of years. You kind of hit on another thing that I noticed about this, because like I said, asteroids is my last <laughs> experience. But there's such a strong like storytelling vibe to this music, but also this real embrace of sound, mm -hmm. which which feels really symphonic because of everything that's available digitally and how sound can work in this format. You can get that sort of just like enveloping sound experience. It's pretty awesome when it happens in a concert hall yeah. played by live people, but it's not it's not the only option, right? Well, let's move on because that was 14 minutes of talking about that. Sorry, Nathan. <laughs> Like a go in. And I will see Victoria, Victoria once more. My heart will sing Victoria, Victoria once more. When was that written? 2021. It's like a perfect, what do they call those? The, the I Want song from the first act. Of a Broadway movie. Oh, yeah. I feel like the composer also like listen to their sound garden because they go into seven four at the end. Maybe it's just like that's the nineties in me. Anytime I hear anybody go into seven four, I'm like, sound garden. Here's the thing that I miss. I'm gonna sing some more about it. I'm gonna build a kind of a climax mm -hmm. and then like the energy's gonna drop and I'm gonna say it really personally and then build up again yeah. and then like finish like alone in the spotlight. In a way, there's a purity to it too, which is so like lovely, you know? Totally. Well, and also just that sort of like longing for a homeland. I just love the use of the Latin like that with the Verdi Requiem and the Mozart Requiem. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Where it just turns into like metal. I will never forget the first time I heard it after hearing like the 4A Requiem and the Mozart Requiem. So yeah. Like, oh, people are dead. Let's, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're nice. Yeah. <laughs> and the Verdi Requiem's like, death is terrifying. <laughs> wow. Like, wow. I would attend the crap out of a live performance of that work. It would be great to have a choir who could do it, including like all the super low stuff. You'd have to hire those those guys who are like ringers for the Rachmaninoff Vespers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> in fact, I know one of those guys. His name, if you can believe it, is Glenn Miller. <laughs> Literally, Glenn Miller. The nicest guy in the world. And he has got one of those like incredible, I sing a real giant low C naturally and it's not like rolling. It's, it's like a beautiful deep sound. And he just has this kind of normal life except a couple times a year he flies everywhere on the planet. The way that you described the sort of outline of the story, like there's, I mean, the whole like fighter pilot thing, that mixture of thrill and terror is yeah. kind of in this music too. It's a real adrenaline rush, but mm -hmm. not quite stable and and just sort of like awesome. You've probably heard it said that there are only like nine or 10 or 12, something like that plots in human existence. <laughs> and, and, and so every time you tell one of these stories, it's connected to all of this stuff. Yeah, This happened back then. And I love the use of music that has these associations from from many years ago.
<laughs> that is fun. Well, it's like full on Harry Potter at the beginning. But there were a couple things in there that surprised me, like mostly the combination of a harpsichord sound mm -hmm. and electric guitar. I don't know. That's just wild to me. Sort yeah. of sort of something that basically sounds like Vivaldi writing yeah. just, you know, repetitive music for the king's dinner or something yeah. like that. Yeah. It, eventually all the instruments go crazy and then just, you know, electric guitar. This composition team over at Hoyo Mix uh, for Genshin Impact in particular is so, everything they do is very fresh and very cutting edge with a modern, it's like old with a modern twist and there are different regions of this game. It seems less sort of narrative. It doesn't seem so much like program music as just like straight up vibe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like vibe and energy building, but but fascinating to know how they use different like sound palettes from different mm -hmm. places. right now yeah, yeah. afterlife he's not in heaven but <laughs> there are big choral works that i know of where um i think all the sopranos would be happier if they actually had like digital recreations of themselves singing it <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like Beethoven nine if you could just like have digital sopranos singing all of those repeated how <laughs> the human sopranos would be like have at it i'm trying to imagine performing something like that live it would be so physically hard to do I, I don't even know if that's real i don't i don't think that can possibly be a real choir it sounds like it but i i mean i don't think so it sounds to me like a sampled sound yeah the electric guitar the some of the the percussion or drum mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. it's like this this meeting of sort of metal and weird like nazi cantata you know what though it's funny you say that because there's a whole aspect of these games these xenoblade games that are based on mechanical versus organic and so that's the that's the juxtaposition because you're you're actually living on these giant beings that are made of machine essentially i'm pretty sure That was written three weeks ago. Wow. That's cool. 
I mean, that feels like somebody who knows about string playing, not just like string sound that they found in like a library. Mm. If somebody presented that in a recital hall with a string quartet and a singer and didn't tell me that it was video game music, I would be like, what language is that? What is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it feels like a modern, a modern retelling of the Vivaldi Four Seasons because it's about the four different emotions of this particular character that's very bad. And so we live in, the, like, apparently there's this paradox where you're living in the emotions of this very vile person. Like all the stuff that you're, that you're linking me to, like all of this is a surprise to me. I didn't know there was anything like that in video games. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. That felt like a song cycle. Mm -hmm, I know. That you would hear in a recital. We're going to be listening to The Lament of Orpheus from Hades. This will not be in the full video due to a variety of issues. However, if you want to check that full video out, ch go ahead to Marco Meatball VODs and you can check it out there or look forward to a 60 second short of, uh, of our chat about this particular piece. Yes. would be thrilling to hear live but it'd be so hard hard to yeah, sing yeah, yeah. that feels like somebody who like did their homework and listened to all the shostakovich symphony <laughs> <laughs> i'm so interested by the fact that the chorus is so far in the background at the beginning and that cello solo is so prominent ludwig was supposed to be like part of the cure for this sickness and instead he became corrupted by it and deformed and he became a man literally with the, his his face became like that of a horse. He was Ludwig the Holy Blade. And I think the reason why the music is so distorted is that he was supposed to be the Holy Knight and instead he became the the cursed. And so you hear that in the crunch. Man, oh man, that's another tale as old as time, like the corrupted yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll give you something lighter. Um, actually, everything I have is not that nice. It's all pretty intense. <laughs> um, That's gorgeous. This theme is actually about the Traveler, which is this giant ball appears at some point in history. The Traveler, people begin to revere it as a god, and it gives us the ability to uh, not die. And so the Traveler is the sort of benevolent, well, we think, benevolent being. It's sort of convoluted who it decides to give its light to. I think that that picks, paints such an interesting depiction of the mysticism uh, of the Traveler. Yeah, totally. That was, what, like three minutes long? Mm -hmm. And just this whole encapsulated story. Harmonic progression after the cello solo started in the beginning was just like beautiful spoilers for anybody who hasn't played shadowbringers just for the record this game enca encapsulates a million different genres and styles and i'm curious to hear what you think of this style <laughs> Yeah. 
actually, you know, I was thinking about those lyrics really quick. It says, to begin, we first must see the end. And actually, the composer Masayoshi Soken uh, wrote this while he was literally hospitalized fighting laryngeal cancer. Wrote this, and I think uh, I think the community at large, really, this I think this track is not just about this particular character and, like, the search for one's home, but also, like, you know, the, the journey of life and stuff. So, curious what you thought about that. It feels very, like, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, but, like, layers and layers and layers of sound. There's a motive in there from the beginning of Shadow bringers the main trailer music the main music of the game then on top of that you've got some references to past expansions and i love knowing that there's there's music from earlier iterations yeah here's everything you've heard before and and something else yeah yeah put into a familiar form but a completely new sound because it's history being accrued which is so fun from a classical perspective to be like oh yeah this is a variation on a theme this is like basic stuff that we know that we hear like you think about like you know the theme of uh what's it rachmaninoff's uh you know like yeah the the, any variations yeah yeah that's yeah that's a compositional technique that goes back so far just taking something simple and continuing to add stuff. But this is like literally adding stuff, not just varying the theme, but like exactly. putting, in all, putting in all of this information from before. And I love how dense and kind of noisy it is. Yeah. is cool rhythmically it's got stuff that would never happen like in ancient times basic vibe of it is so thousand years ago yeah but then it's got that little yeah ba, 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 which is something totally different it's not like from periton or the 11th century <laughs> So video game music often uses the organ as a device to either show showcase unholiness or to showcase uh, religious fanaticism. So uh, literally like what movies have done. And yeah. there's another trope, like main music maker in the church there to signify not that everything is holy, but that something is really deeply uh, Really bad, yeah. 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 <laughs> voices in the orchestration are so individual that mm -hmm. feels like somebody that like knows their orchestra there's such contrast in the vocal writing mm -hmm. there's the whole like carl orff like that latin badass lat but then it totally changes character that feels like someone who's in love with with the mechanics and the the like sound personalities of different distinctive instruments in an old style orchestra. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the power of uh, Nobuo Uematsu is he's sort of the the grandfather of Final Fantasy and the father of, you know, he, he was writing on chiptune since at 35 years old, he was like- I don't know what chiptune is. Oh, so chiptune is, um, oh, I'll have to play you some. When I say chiptune, I actually think I'm, I think I'm say, talking about more like MIDI. Yeah. That sounds really old. This Dancing Mad sequence is actually a full symphonic movement. There are four movements and, and I forget the, the saying is, Uematsu composing such a masterpiece using the SNES sound chip would be like as if Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel with crayons. <laughs> And uh, that's what people people love this piece. Going back to Liberty Fatali, so you see the evolution where this person composed this, and then a couple years later in 1999, composed you know with essentially that was also that was MIDI, but you know it it still has that orchestral. It's the same sort of learned, and he, I believe he's also self-taught. None of this is like from school, which is even crazier. I'm sort of being confronted with my incredible lack of awareness of 
what the sound worlds actually are like. I think my sort of sound model for like computer sound is what you just played for me. It's interesting to hear your, your anecdote that this is like Michelangelo painting the, the Sistine Chapel with crayons. It does make me think like, if you are an interesting composer, why would you work in that sound world? Like, why would you want to? They had no choice. That was what they had. Yeah, but it's also 30 years ago. And it's, a, again, my concept of improvement is how good is a digital piano and not like what you're playing for me. I think I didn't know how good it could sound. So I guess before we wrap up and then I ask you a bunch of piercing questions about how, how you've come away from this video, um, I would love it if you would share a little bit about, you know, who you are, what you've done in the world. You're a prolific, prolific person in the, in the industry. And I'd love to sort of, you know, get your, your, your abridged CV and I'll tag your actual, uh, bio and website in the about oh, section. But. I I've spent a whole lot of my life working in opera. Um, I'm a pianist. And um, originally, I just worked with singers because I thought singing was so interesting. It's this incredibly brave and vulnerable act. You have to like breathe in and then like make your own noise. And piano is like this giant 19th century machine, like made out of steel. And, <laughs> and you can kind of hide behind it. But there's something about playing the piano that isn't intimate and vulnerable at all. You're more like at the wheel of a giant car. I ended up um, apprenticing at the San Francisco Opera, and then I worked for a bunch of opera companies for a long time. The ones that were major in my life, where I spent major time, were San Francisco, the Metropolitan Opera, Houston Grand Opera, and the Vienna State Opera. And then after that, I pivoted into education because it was time for something different. Now I'm on the faculty of Baylor University in Texas, and I still uh, play the piano for people. Um, I recently made a recording that is doing pretty well in classical terms uh, with a wonderful singer named Emily Albrink. I still do some conducting. I'm writing a libretto right now. I, I do a lot of cool projects. Right now I'm in Tokyo um, coaching people who want to sing opera in Tokyo. The coolest thing about this profession is that it's kind of taken me all over the world and put me in positions where I could meet a lot of people that I wouldn't otherwise meet. And yeah. Yeah. I've been pretty fortunate. It's a wild ride and I'm and I'm still on. I haven't fallen off yet. So <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the things I was most afraid of when I when I decided to leave and pivot to voiceover and and then subsequently on accident this YouTube channel was uh, the loss of meeting cool people and interesting people and and, um, and voiceover was very global for me and it continues to be global. And then this YouTube channel, I mean, if you're watching this, uh, chances are you don't always necessarily live in the United States. And it's been really great to be able to, like, I have a lot of, you know, speak different languages on streams and, you know, people are like, you know, wow, you speak French. Wow, you speak German. My German is absolute trash. I know you speak German. Uh, uh, but my, <laughs> I have a lot of German audience. But isn't it amazing to be connected with people all over the world? I mean, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, that's it, the power of music too, you know. Let's wrap up with uh, with this beautiful piece, Kindred, the Eternal Hunters, and then I'll ask you a couple questions, and then I will let you go to sleep because um, <laughs> it's very late for you there. Yeah, right. this is really fun though. I'm really this is this is so I'm, cool. I'm glad that you liked it because it, it, it's important. That's beautiful. That's a character theme. What do you think that that character is about just from the music as a fun little guessing game? That's a great question. I have no idea, obviously. It feels really solitary to me. Mm -hmm. It feels really lonely. It's funny that you say solitary because uh, the lore suggests, if I remember correctly, that a man was lonely and carved out 
the two uh, beings and sort of brought them into being, brought them into life. The piano represents a graceful way to die. Like, oh, if you'd like, you can, you know, the sort of like, not the Green Reaper, but sort of an angel. And the cello represents the wolf and the wolf um, will hunt you down if you resist death. And so okay. the duality there plays into each other. It is beautiful. It's really evocative. To wrap things up, you know, we're going on two hours and 15 minutes here. Thank you so much, Kathy, for taking, you know, I know you've had a very busy day. Coming away with this, like, what's your perspective on video game music now that you've listened to it? Because you, you had no knowledge besides Asteroids before these two hours. So like, That's right. what's, your, what's your takeaway? Obviously, there's there's a lot more that I have to learn, especially since by your own admission, you're kind of playing me some classics. I was like, here, let's gently guide you in. I'm surprised by the quality of the sound world. I'm surprised by the quality of some of the composition, the detail of instrumental and vocal understanding, and the sort of like world painting. I'm surprised to hear so many examples that feel really recognizable and really connected to sort of theatrical traditions of the past. I find myself just surprised and sort of delighted by it. You made such a good point earlier about people being invited to come into classical spaces to hear, you know, like video game music, and then people hoping that they'll come back. I feel like I should spend some more time in video game spaces, not necessarily playing games, but as you sent me these clips, I see that there's like acres of music available because that's what a professional musician should do is to know what is happening in other genres. And this is a genre that I hadn't really considered. Do you think that the that there is a stigma in the classical music world that music that isn't classical innate, like the standard, you know, symphonic literature is sort of looked down upon? A very difficult hurdle for people steeped in classical traditions is making it over the non-live performance, non-acoustic. Mm -hmm. well, one of the sort of lines that we've drawn in the sand is we, we don't use mics. Like our... Right. our are and and that becomes this whole like battlefield i didn't use a microphone <laughs> I, I saw a mic taped to that person it's like well, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's just for the recording that just serves to illustrate the fact that that's like a defining point so i think that is often like the sticking point the idea that a click track is depersonalizing or that anything that's synced up to anything else is Mm -hmm. personalized and therefore a step out of the out of the tradition but but it's also just lack of familiarity right no yeah. matter what tradition you play in people from outside of classical traditions feel uncomfortable with classical traditions because they don't understand what they are the reverse is also true was there a track today that you listened to that st sticks out to you as one of your favorites yeah i loved the last one um, oh, Kindred. Nice. Yeah, I really did. I can't remember if it was Space Ninjas or the one right after that. Well, the Duviri Paradox. Yes, for Warframe, the Space Ninjas. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It is the Space Ninjas. It okay. is the Space Ninjas. Yeah. So you really like that one in Kindred. Yeah, that was yeah. that was cool. The one that I ranted about for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gorgeous. Well, listen, Kathy, I mean, thank you so much for, first of all, you know, reaching out to me after you saw that post I made and also just, uh, you know, being so open minded. I think it's... Uh, I think it's exciting and I'm sure that the viewers will also be really grateful to learn some nuggets from you and you're such a prolific and important person and especially in the opera scene I feel like you know it's it's cool to have you on here and I hope that that also expands out for more people that are like oh Kathy Kelly went on well shoot I gotta go watch some I gotta go listen to some video game music and, and hopefully we can keep this going. I think it's so cool what you're doing and like it's a great opportunity because we know each other for mm -hmm. to just learn some more stuff. This was very awesome. Thank you so much for doing it. And thanks for putting that invitation out there. I hope, I hope more people like grab onto it and come onto your show and yeah, here's some stuff. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Well, thanks Kathy. And, and thank you everybody for watching this, especially if you watch the unedited version, you're an MVP. And if you watch the short version on the channel, well, I hope you enjoyed that too. Stay tuned for shorts, uh, for some of the copyrighted songs that we have, uh, We'll adjust for you to make everybody happy. And as always, thanks a ton. Feel free to like, subscribe, and uh, I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye, y'all.